we will uh, do today is that um, uh, I will ask John and Basco to introduce their mandates to you, uh, their, uh, the, the recent developments that they have been working on, and also uh, ask uh, perhaps how they can see that their mandates can uh, benefit the environmental community since they are appointed by the human rights uh, community. After that, we will go to our uh, other panelists. Those are Achim Haupart, who is the Chief of the UN Environment, Chemicals and Waste Branch. We have Bruce Boring of the uh, World Health Organization, Valen Tatsa of UNICE, United Nations Environment, uh, Economic Commission for Europe, and Gonzalo Oviedo, who is from the Senior Advisor of uh, International uh, ICN. Um, and I want to ask them how they see that the mandate of the Special Rapporteur is beneficial for the work or not, or how they can interact um, with this human rights related uh, mandates. So that's the program of today. Um, this uh, event is uh, organized by the Geneva Environment Network, basically uh, supported by the government uh, of Switzerland. Um, together with the Earth Just Justice the, and the, United, the, the Office of the United Nations High Commission on Human Rights. And um, I also hope uh, that uh, you uh, come with uh, questions or uh, interesting points uh, later after the presentation. So I suggest you uh, kick off with uh, John. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara, and thank you to all of you for being here. Thanks especially to um, UNEP, uh, the UN Environment Program, or UN Environment now, for, um, for organizing this, and all, uh, also just for all the support that they've given me over, uh, over the years for my mandate. Um, so the question is, how can human rights contribute to the protection of the environment? And in my work, I, I think there are three basic answers to that question. So I'm going to give you the answers, and then I'm going to describe essentially what I've done in my mandate and how I think it illustrates the answers to the question. So the three uh, chief advantages I see of a human rights perspective on environmental protection are, first, it clarifies what's at stake. It clarifies that the questions about how and whether to protect the environment um, implicate basic <coughs> fundamental rights that we all have our ability to live lives of dignity, freedom, and equality depend on our ability to enjoy a healthy and safe environment. Um, the second advantage is that a human rights perspective clarifies obligations that states have as a result of their commitments under human rights law that have direct application to environmental protection. And I'll describe in a moment what I mean by those obligations. And then third, and not last but not least, um, a human rights approach opens new forums for considering environmental problems. The forums range from uh, intergovernmental forums such as the Human Rights Council to regional bodies such as the European Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American System to national level bodies such as national human rights commissions. But what all of these forums have in common is that they are increasingly, over the last several years, hearing environmental cases, but they're hearing them in the context of a human rights regime. That is, they're applying their own human rights uh, obligations and agreements and statutes and constitutional rights to environmental cases. So uh, let me, I know some of you are already familiar with this, but let, I, I think it, in the rest of my time, I'll kind of take you through the work I've done in the mandate and the history of the mandate a little bit. So the relationship between human rights and the environment has not always been clear, to put it mildly, and it's one that the Human Rights Council and its predecessor, the Human Rights Commission, um, acknowledged in various ways, but never really uh, fully explored. With ex One of the ways it acknowledged it was through, for example, the creation of the mandate that's now Bashkut's mandate, the mandate on toxics. But efforts to, in the 90s, efforts to uh, have a declaration on human rights in the environment went nowhere, and in some ways that kind of poisoned the, the discussion for quite a while. So that changed about seven or eight years ago when a group of countries, including Switzerland, Costa Rica, and the Maldives, 
began to uh, convince other countries to create a new mandate on human rights and the environment. Now, I know many of you, maybe all of you, are familiar with the Human Rights Council's system of mandates, but just very briefly, the Human Rights Council appoints independent experts to, in most cases, monitor and promote compliance with existing human rights norms. Um, and normally it calls these experts special rapporteurs. In most cases, these special rapporteurs are dealing with norms that are already clear. So the special rapporteur on torture, of course, has the advantage of there being a convention against torture. Um, but with respect to the environment, the norms, at least as far as the council saw them, were not so clear. So instead of appointing a special rapporteur, instead they decided to create a mandate that would clarify the relationship between human rights and the environment. And there were precedents for this. Most recently, the mandate on the right to water in Katerina de Albuquerque was appointed. Uh, before that, the mandate on business and human rights with John Ruggie. And like those mandates, the mandate on human rights and the environment, when it was first created in March 2012, was asked to identify and clarify the obligations, the human rights obligations relating to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, and to identify good practices. But not so much to focus on compliance and implementation. Because the idea was simply that how can you be pushing governments to comply with norms until we're clear on what the norms are? So I was appointed the honor of being appointed to that later in 2012. Um, do you want just a side note on what it's like to be appointed to a mandate when it's first starting off? The, the mandate was created in March of 2012. Um, the, the applications then were taken and, and the applicants reviewed, and I was appointed formally in July of 2012. My mandate, uh, my uh, I, I formally took up the mandate as of August 1st. August, as you no doubt know, in Geneva is not the, uh, let's say, busiest time. So <laughs> I didn't receive a call from Geneva until September of 2012. The mandate by this time was formally six months old. I was brought out to Geneva in, 20, in, in September of 2012. I was told that, by the way, the Human Rights Council budget is not approved by the General Assembly until December of 2012. <laughs> also, your first report even though it will be presented in March of 2013, it, the draft, I mean, the, you need to finalize it for interpretation purposes by early December, about a week before your budget will be approved. I was also asked, how are you at raising money? And I, was, I answered, very bad. I didn't realize that was really one of the qualifications for the job. Um, in any event, that's, that's all a long time ago, but it still stayed with me as kind of an indication of how different it is to take over an existing mandate as opposed to one that's still getting off the ground. All right, so I, I'm, I'm using up my 10 minutes on, on, on um, non-responsive uh, points here, but let me just briefly then say, so I spent a great deal of time in the first two years of the mandate essentially mapping what human rights institutions had said about environmental protection. With the help of a number of pro bono attorneys and academics, I issued a series of 14 reports, each of which identified essentially every statement that a human rights body had made about environmental issues. And what I found was, when I came to put all these together, was that there was a remarkable degree of coherence in what human rights institutions were saying about environmental protection, despite the fact that they were relying on a, a vast array of different agreements, from the International Covenants on Civil and Political and Economic, Social and Cultural Rights to regional agreements and many others in between, they were reaching remarkably similar conclusions. And they were doing this even though there is no globally accepted right to a healthy environment. What they were doing instead was what I called greening human rights. That is, they were taking existing human rights, such as rights to life, health, property, privacy, and regional agreements, and applying them to environmental situations. And what they were finding was that there was a, a set of human rights obligations that governments have to protect human rights from environmental harm. And briefly, these obligations, this general obligation to protect has uh, obligations that I categorized into three sets. Procedural obligations, substantive obligations, and obligations that states owe to those in particularly vulnerable situations. Procedurally, and I'll just list them, but we can talk about them more if you have questions later. 
Uh, procedurally, the obligations include obligations to provide information about environmental problems and situation, obligations to uh, provide for public participation, um, informed public participation in environmental decision making, and obligations to provide effective access to legal remedies for environmental harm. Substantively, human rights bodies were, uh, they provided states more discretion. Human rights bodies are not in the business of saying you have to allow no more than you know, 0.007 parts per million of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere or you're in violation of a human rights treaty. But in, the discretion is not unlimited. States have to essentially strike a reasonable balance between the levels of environmental protection they want to adopt and other societal interests. Um, the balance can never be discriminatory. They can't discriminate in the application of their environmental laws, and it should not be retrogressive. States should not go backwards. And once states have struck this balance, they have to implement it. Human rights bodies are pretty strict about states living up to the obligations once they've taken them on. And then finally, the third set of obligations um, with respect to those in vulnerable situations are particularly detailed with respect to indigenous peoples. For obvious reasons, they depend so closely on environmental amenities um, for their very way of life, their culture, um, but, but human rights bodies have also begun to elaborate more detailed obligations with, res with respect to other groups such as women and children. In fact, this Friday, tomorrow, the Committee on the Rights of the Child is having a day of general discussion on children's rights in the environment, um, which I, I hope some of you will be able to go to. Um, so I reported all this to the Human Rights Council. The next year I reported on good practices to the Human Rights Council. You see the, um, my, my, I have my own um, website and all of the reports are available through that as well as through the OHCHR website. In March 2015, the, the Human Rights Council decided to renew the mandate for another three years and change my title to be a special rapporteur. Um, I often, <laughs> I, I did not anticipate I would get asked this, but I have often been asked, is that essentially a promotion? Um, and it is not a promotion. Um, it involved no change in my salary because my salary was zero. And so I, I sometimes say it doubled my salary, but there's, um, I, I guess I could, from the baseline of zero, it doesn't have much difference. I mean, I, you know, as you know, these independent positions, the whole point is that we're not UN employees. So, um, so in that sense, I can't be promoted. But I do think it's a promotion in a sense for the mandate itself because. I think the Human Rights Council essentially recognized that the norms were now clear enough. The norms, uh, the human rights norms relating to the environment were clear enough that now um, it made sense to have the same kind of special rapporteurship for the environment that they had already created for other uh, types of human rights. And so in keeping with that, they asked me to do more work on implementing and promoting compliance, but they also asked me to continue to clarify the norms where they needed clarification. So since then, I've, the mandate has proceeded on two tracks, an implementation track, in which I've, you know, I undertake country visits, <coughs> I receive communications, um, I, I hold judicial workshops, I help with, with an idea that Akeem and I first talked about several years ago. UNITAR now has a course on human rights and the environment and so forth. I'm hoping to develop, I'm planning to develop practical guidelines which summarize the norms in a, in a practical way. Um, and present that to the Human Rights Council next year. In the second track, the clarification track, I um, issued a report in March on, or presented a report in March on human rights and climate change, trying to clarify how human rights obligations apply to climate change. And I'm currently working on a report to the Council on human rights and biological diversity. We had an expert <coughs> meeting yesterday, and I'm having a public meeting, actually, right after this meeting at the Palais des Nations. Um, where I'm going to receive comments on that. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I, the, I'll just conclude by saying that my mandate is actually reaching the, uh, I can kind of see the end in sight. Uh, the, the mandate will, my, my term on the mandate will end in March 2018. Um, but I'm very hopeful that the mandate is now, uh, that the relationship of human rights and the environment is clear enough that the mandate will continue as part of the ongoing work of the Human Rights Council and, and the United Nations Human Rights Mechanism. Um, and I think I'll just stop there. Thank you again. Thank you, gentlemen. I also
also actually hope it won't only influence the human rights canons, so, but also, for example, the United Nations environment. Um, uh, John referred to his uh, website. You see it uh, at the back. It's uh, S <coughs> SR Environment, altogether both the org without the www. And believe me, it's a lot easier to navigate that website than the OCHITA website. So if you want to find more information, then uh, um, then that's the way to go. Uh, Bashkut, oh, by the way, also has a website, www. It's the bit, the three ones, uh, srtoxics.org. Uh, Bashkut, I give the floor to you. Thank you, Barbara, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'd also like to thank the organizers, UNEP and Earth Justice, the, the Swiss government and others for, for organizing this important me meeting. I think this is the first time that John and I have had the chance to be on a panel together, so it's, it's a great opportunity. Uh, for those who, who might not be familiar with the mandate on toxics, uh, it was actually created in the mid-90s. It was the illegal dumping of waste in developing countries. And so, to this day, uh, it still oftentimes is referred to the mandate on toxic waste. But in 2011, the mandate expanded significantly. Uh, it recognized the importance of a life cycle approach to addressing the issue of waste and the impacts on human rights can happen throughout the life cycle of hazardous substances and wastes. Uh, so accordingly, the mandate was um, refashioned as it is today to, to look at the full life cycle of hazardous substances and wastes. So now the mandate encompasses uh, extractive industries, consumer products, pharmaceuticals, um, nuclear, and manufacturing activities, the issues confronting workers, and of course the traditional issue of waste. Um, I, I assumed the mandate in, in 2014. Uh, it was, I think, June of 2014 that I was appointed. And after that appointment, I, I conducted a series of consultations with states, with businesses, uh, civil society. I think, I think we had over 100 consultations, um, individual as well as collectively. And through that process, I identified three priorities for the mandate moving forward. The first one was the issue of raising awareness of toxics, of pollution, of waste, uh, as a human rights issue. Despite the mandate being around for nearly 20 years at that point, um, I found a surprisingly low level of awareness um, and recognition that, that those issues are and can be uh, human rights issues. So that was one priority. The second priority I identified was, was one um, which I just presented a report to the Human Rights Council on, which is the impact of toxics and pollution on children. And, and this is uh, an issue that, that I think over the past two years has continued, in my mind, to increase in importance, the unique vulnerability of children uh, in a variety of circumstances. <coughs> and finally, the third priority I identified was businesses, the responsibility of businesses to respect human rights what that means in terms of the due diligence that they must undertake when it comes to their toxic chemical footprint, uh, the waste that they're generating, and, and trying to strengthen the linkage between the environmental communities, the public health communities, and the discussions that are ongoing within the Human Rights Council around business responsibilities. Um, so so it's, been, it's been about two years since I've had the mandate, and I guess a lot of what I would say about what human rights can bring to environmental issues, it echoes a lot of what John, John said as well. Um, the, the first thing I, I would like to emphasize is that, in, in my experience, the, the lens of human rights, it, it helps to illustrate the, the plight of victims, those that are in especially vulnerable situations, those who are at grave risk of of impacts due to toxics, due to pollution, and due to waste. Um, in various missions that, that I've been able to undertake over the past two years, I've seen um, cases where a consumer product, an untested 
under-regulated consumer product killed dozens of, of newborn children, um, pregnant women as well. Um, in, in another country I visited, a community that was living near uh, the world's largest oil and gas condensate field uh, was experiencing a rash of seizures, especially among children. Um, for two months, children were suddenly developing seizures, rushed to the hospital. Um, and of course, many of you are familiar with the situation of Flint, Michigan, which has been highlighted in the media over the past several months or years, I would say, um, where six to 12,000 children were exposed to, to very high levels of lead. And this is a community that was predominantly African American and um, I think about 30% lived at poverty or below poverty levels. Um, the, the plight of workers, ILO has figures suggesting that nearly two million workers die every year um, from occupational diseases linked to toxic chemicals and other hazardous substances in the workplace. Uh, in some of my missions, I've seen communities that are uh, largely <coughs> comprised of, of those who are elderly and the severe impacts that they're experiencing, whether it's due to contamination of groundwater or air pollution that's disproportionately affecting them. Um, other, other groups that I've seen at, at disproportionate risk are, are low-income communities, minority communities, uh, migrant workers, indigenous peoples. Um, so in my mind, the, the human rights lens helps to illustrate the vulnerabilities that these groups face, the disproportionate impacts that they're experiencing, and the serious challenges to an effective remedy uh, that confront them time and again. In my view, the, the narrative of human rights, when we're talking about the right to life, the right to adequate housing, the right to safe water, safe food, um, it's, it's a different narrative, and it's a more powerful narrative, I think, than, than talking about uh, risks due to polybrominated diphenyl ethers or something like that. I mean, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is impacts, and I think the human rights lens helps to, to illustrate this. Um, also, I think, sort of echoing what, what John said, the, the human rights um, corpus of, of laws and, and um, general comments has, has strongly indicated that prevention and precaution must be a priority for states, for businesses. And I think this helps to perhaps orient and guide where international environmental laws, national environmental laws need to be going. Um, in, in the field in which I operate, chemicals and wastes, there are numerous gaps. When, when we look at the global treaties, we see that 26 substances are currently managed throughout their life cycle um, under, under existing treaties. But when we compare that to the, to the number of hazardous substances, which number in the thousands, there are serious gaps, and these gaps result in double standards for countries where particularly developing countries, least developed countries, are at serious risk of either having manufacturing processes that industrialized countries have phased out or other products which create these double standards. <coughs> Interestingly, um, the Committee on the Rights of the Child last year looked at this issue of double standards and with respect to one country, it noted that the country continued to import a large number of pesticides that had, in many countries, been banned, and including some of the countries that were exporting into that country. And, and it made a strong recommendation to the government uh, to stop that practice and to transition to agroecological practices or other safer means uh, that would pr protect children that were continuing to be poisoned by these hazardous pesticides. Um, I think that's one example of how human rights mechanisms can perhaps um, augment or even further encourage countries to move towards uh, a healthier environment for all. The third point um, I want to make is that the human rights lens also helps to illustrate accountability gaps. Accountability is certainly one of the principles of, of international human rights law, 
And whether we're, whether we're talking about states or, or businesses, um, when, when one looks at the issues from the aspect of accountability, we see severe challenges. Uh, WHO has figures that 12 million people die prematurely from uh, an unhealthy environment every year. Um, when we look at that from the accountability perspective, uh, there are serious questions about exactly how many states, how many businesses are accountable for those impacts. Um, the, the recent figures from Interpol suggest a very sharp increase in the illegal trade of pesticides, uh, counterfeit pesticides, illegal trade in waste. Um, increasingly, the environmental issue is becoming more and more a criminal issue. We, we heard recently about the International Criminal Court um, opening the door to environmental suits as well. And I think this, this accountability question, this accountability framing can really help in pushing the, the environmental issue um, and, and really help to encourage a, a transition towards what, what UNEP and others have called a green economy, further incentivizing businesses and other relevant actors to transition to safer chemicals, safer technologies. Um, and finally, I, I think from, from the perspective of uh, myself as being a special rapporteur and, and other special rapporteurs, often what we need is, is more than, than just language in, in agreements. For example, in the agreements that comprise the strategic approach to international chemicals management, we, we saw language um, requiring, in, in soft law terms, uh, that that businesses and states respect human rights in, in 2006 in the context of sound chemicals management. But uh, from, from my experience over the past two years, it seems that we have a long way to go in terms of how businesses assess these risks, in terms of how states have made these linkages. And I think that's part of our responsibility, and that's really where I hope this mandate continues to contribute. Thank you. And also for me, it's a great pleasure to have both John and Baskut next to me together because we have done lots of work together individually, but it's really nice to see also the, the consolidated thinking in, in one panel. Um, our annotations are meant to be forward-looking, but I actually want to take you to an event in 1992 to the, the Rio summit where heads of states adopted Agenda 21. And, and one chapter in Agenda 21 in 1992 dealt with chemicals management. It's a 10-page pen, a pen document. And if you look at that document, you count no less than 12 times right to know in it. Uh, so the thinking on linking rights and environment and chemicals was already present some time ago. But we have seen then that in the 90s, a lot of focus was placed on the development of multilateral environmental agreements. And although some very concrete progress has been made on a number of chemicals, as Basco outlined, um, some, some of the broader issues that were outlined in 1992, uh, dealing with the many thousands of chemicals that do have, do have hazardous properties were, were not a priority then during the 90s. So um, we are facing a big challenge now with 130 chemicals, uh, on uh, 30,000 chemicals on the market, um, perhaps 3,000 of them uh, fully assessed. 
um, and, and, and new knowledge is, is coming to the forefront every day and how do we deal with some of these challenges beyond those that are, I think, well controlled through global chemicals uh, MEAs. Um, now, in some cases, um, like lead, and, and this was mentioned by Vasco, the cases are clear. I mean, we know about the toxicity of lead, how it impacts um, uh, neurological development of children, what it does to cardiovascular diseases. We do have the epidemiology statistics, more than 600,000 premature deaths per year. So I think the case can be made very clearly on some of these chemicals. Many of the others, I think the situation is, is not as clear because individual chemicals uh, can, cannot not be identified um, the way also depleting chemicals for some of the persistent organic pollutants um, were identified as chemicals which really uh, address uh, uh, or, or need uh, global action. So, so we are talking about very, slow, uh, very minimal doses, but we're talking about thousands of products um, which we all are exposed to. Many of us have more than 100 chemicals in, in the body, but the individual doses do not, um, uh, you know, from a risk assessment perspective, uh, point, point uh, immediate to immediate action needed. And in the area of risk assessment, we're also seeing uh, developments and, and new knowledge that the dose response relationships that has been uh, used traditionally in risk assessment is not necessarily working anymore for all chemicals. For example, you may have heard of endocrine disrupting chemicals where you know, one single molecule in an exposure at the prenatal stage can actually trigger some developments such as different gene expressions, which then uh, create results uh, later on in, in life. So these relationships are complex. The science is, is developing. Um, the, there are different uh, points of views. So really, then to make that linkages to, to a human right, the way it is possible for lead, or the uh, uh, humidifier disinfectant case that, uh, that Vasco outlined uh, after uh, going to South Korea, that the cases are, are, are much more complex right now. So, so nevertheless, though, how can we bring the human rights and the chemical management um, um, uh, areas together? Um, we do have a very important process uh, underway internationally, um, which is uh, led by or, or taking place under the strategic approach to international chemicals management that Vasco already referred to. And here, governments and stakeholders are now getting together um, over the next four to five years to look not only at the question, how can we achieve the sound management of chemicals by 2020, but what's some of the unfinished business beyond 2020, and what can international policy uh, do to really address uh, some of the issues that were already outlined in 1992. And, and here, I think there's a great opportunity to bring the human rights perspective into this process. There will be a meeting of the open-ended working group of SICAM in 2018, and we would encourage um, that also the two uh, special rapporteurs actively contribute to these discussions so that the thinking um, about two, uh, beyond 2020 revives some of the uh, rights-based linkages that, uh, that were already included in our discussions in 1992. We also um, are, are working on um, the next version of the Global Chemicals Outlook, and there we are trying to take stock of existing knowledge that could be relevant for policymakers in designing the beyond 2020 approach to chemicals and waste management. And perhaps here also there is the possibility to channel some of the knowledge generated uh, through some of your work into, into this global assessment, because we feel that looking at beyond 2020 or knowledge relevant to shape 2020 without dealing with the government's governance dimension uh, would, would, would be not seeing uh, the, the big picture. So these are concrete uh, processes which are underway where we could see uh, linkages. Um, we also see opportunities um, at, at the country level. Um, here, Basquiat has referred to his several missions, um, but, but we, we cannot clone Basquiat 20 times, and, and he's coming back with really interesting reports. So we need to think through how do we um, support capacity development at the country level to help identify some of these cases that you are identifying through your report. Uh, because ultimately it needs to be also um, scientists and NGOs and others working together at the country level to put the evidence on the table to in trigger uh, decision makers to understand that they need to put in place basic uh, regulatory infrastructure. And I think the humidifier disinfectant case in, in South Korea where also the, the, the global company now apologized 
um, uh, for the case. It triggered in South Korea the development of new legislation so that uh, chemicals now put on the market are subject to screening because in this particular case there was not a law in place and therefore also a product could go on the market without the proper testing. So, so here we have opportunities for capacity development and putting right to know in practice at the country level, getting the right laws in place as called for already in 2000, uh, 1992. The second one is, is the substantive uh, linkages, um, moving beyond uh, the, the procedural rights. And, um, and there, we, we're seeing now that there is an appetite in many countries in the world to develop basic regulatory capacity for, for chemical management. And we just had a, a workshop with the global chemical industry last week in Shanghai, where all stakeholders agreed, government, industry, and, and civil society, that one of the top priorities for the next years is to put basic regulatory capacity in place in country because I think only through this we can have a sustainable solution. In other words, the human rights approach with individual cases and, 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 and court proceedings which are resource intensive can raise the issue but they cannot solve the generic uh, problems we are, we are facing with so many chemicals. So I think it's very important to, to, to maintain that momentum and use also the SICAM beyond 2020 process to focus on these basic regulatory capacities. Last, a, a few points on some of then the um, challenges that, that, that I think we are facing also in, in, in building up those regulatory capacity. First is the burden of proof <coughs> issue. Um, you know, in the, in the area of pharmaceutic, uh, pharmaceuticals and pesticides, we have seen um, development of positive lists. In other words, un unless a chemical is approved, <laughs> it cannot be put on the market. In the area of industrial chemicals, it, 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 you know, the, the tendency in the past has been to work with negative lists. You know, everything can be on the market unless you can prove that it is a, a cause uh, to human health and the environment. There are now developments uh, in some regions. You may have heard about the European REACH regulation, which is moving towards registration systems and really making sure uh, basic um, data sets are available for all chemicals and products on the market. And you know, we have to think internationally, how can we also use some of these data uh, as, as we are moving towards a global approach uh, in, in the future. And that global approach needs to be different um, than perhaps what we've seen in the past, because we have seen um, that the production of chemicals has have moved. China is now the most significant producer of chemicals um, and has a new law, and we've seen many other emerging uh, economies. So in order to put really the human rights perspective um, back, back um, you know, or, or, or in, in, in ensuring its, its enforcement, uh, we need to understand also the global patterns of, of uh, pa uh, production and, and, and use. And, and related to this is, I think, um, we're seeing a lot of different um, mergers and acquisitions in the chemical industry. And I think the case in South Korea uh, was, was a situation where I think a global company operating out of the UK bought a South Korean company. And uh, at that time, um, during this acquisition, there was probably no due diligence process in place to, to look at some of the products that, that this, this company that was bought was producing. So, so we're seeing all these mergers and acquisition, and, and how can we also um, work on, on or encourage due diligence processes so, so that these type of um, situations don't occur anymore. Um, my, my final point is, is then um, uh, to look at, at also the precautionary principle, which again was adopted uh, through the Rio principles in 1992. And, and it says that in the absence of concrete proof you know, uh, we may want to take precautionary action. Um, and, and that's something I think also we need to think through uh, because uh, through a precautionary uh, uh, approach, the human rights dimension can be brought into the chemicals and waste discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Achim. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Human Rights Council know there's always a strict two-minute speaking slot. So everybody talks as fast as possible, I also say everything in two minutes. And I think you also try to sneak as much as possible <laughs> in the middle of the period. But thank you for your reaction also on the, um, yeah, on actually on this uh, really important uh, uh, development. So we would like now to go to uh, Bruce. Bruce Gordon 
is uh, from the World Health Organization. He's the coordinator of water, sanitation, hygiene, and health. Yes, you have a microphone. Thank you very much. Um, it's also a pleasure to be here. Um, and speaking of uh, uh, speaking quickly, um, for those of you that knew our previous um, special rapporteur for water and sanitation, <laughs> Albert, she managed to jam quite a bit in. Um, so I'm not going to try to emulate her, but um, I would. I mean, we were sort of, you know, sort of asked to think what would be the, the, the benefits of, of working with the special rapporteur in terms of taking their mandate forward, and I think. From the water and sanitation perspective, certainly we have had this sort of ongoing journey take place um, with, with Katarina and now with Leo Keller. Um, and uh, in many ways, I'd like to kind of reflect a little bit on that journey um, and, uh, you know, sort of kind of swish these two wor worlds together. Certainly for, we're at a really interesting time um, because, um, and maybe using water and sanitation as a case study, the, the, the sort of dominant paradigm before was, was really looking at water and sanitation as you know, services, basic services for, for people, um, and uh, that really was very proximal. It was, you know, having a tap and a toilet kind of thing. And now, um, you know, with, with the SDGs and sort of with wider thinking around sustainability, I think this idea of the environment um, is, is really coming to the fore. And with it comes a whole heck of a lot of complexity. Um, so some people are a little bit hesitant to get into that space, but I think um, certainly with the, the sort of do, uh, dedicated goal um, to water, SDG 6, um, we're seeing that everyone is, 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 is very much committed. Um, uh, so maybe a, a couple of reflections first. So the, the thing, and, and I think Dr. you mentioned two things that I thought were very interesting. One was this issue of prevention. And I think, obviously, as a health organization, that's why we're here. Um, and. Uh, Possibly more um, kind of interesting, the whole issue of exposing the vulnerable and the issue of the whole accountability and monitoring issue. We've done, because uh, one thing I think that water and sanitation has benefited from having very clear, almost black and white sort of global reports and to a certain extent country reports on who has access and who doesn't, right? So 2.5 billion people lack sanitation, food sanitation, um, and, and we know that. Um, and that sort of report card has come out consistently um, and is actually, um, you know, through the WHO and the Social uh, Monitoring Program. And with that, so that was sort of the, the first iteration, this improved, unimproved sort of black and white dichotomy. Now, we're starting to look at this issue of um, exposing uh, inequalities to, to, to greater extents. Um, so uh, very um, kind of crude, uh, presentations of this through urban and rural, but also through wealth quintiles, um, giving some analysis on you know, the, the extent to which uh, poor uh, populations get access to services um, at different rates than richer populations. Um, and, but, but really, I think this idea of, of getting countries to, to come to account uh, through this sort of um, almost, I would say, global report card. Interestingly enough, I think the, the other uh, issue around monitoring is, and very much linked to human rights, is this, this idea of the state's obligation to provide this enabling environment. And um, when we think about the enabling environment, um, you know, certain things come to mind. One is allocation of expenditure. On water and sanitation, there was no understanding of where money was going to. There was no system of national uh, um, a management system for financing like there is for health. So one of the things that, that a lot of people have been putting a lot of work into is, is trying to put in place management systems in countries so that they can better understand where the money is going to. Um, that's one thing. But we do have enough information to understand certain things about um, you know, how aid is going. And we know that, uh, for example, you know, very small amounts of aid are going to basic services, which is a possible proxy for the most vulnerable. Um, where sort of organized systems, big water treatment uh, and distribution systems are, are receiving a heck of a lot more money. So really trying to, to make that transparent, I think that, that, that is something that, that, that has helped um, in, in this, this, this journey. Um, what else do I want to say? So um, 
you know, when I talked to Leo Heller, who is now our, our water and sanitation special rapporteur, he, he wanted to say one thing, and, and uh, he said, should we say anything? And he just said, look, the right to sanitation is going to be um, very much um, sort of helping in terms of protecting the environment. The right to sanitation is, is, is not about um, just having a, a basic toilet. Now it is about the whole chain of um, you know, looking at excreta um, and excreta in wastewater and trying to make sure that that is collected, treated, um, sorry, collected and um, removed, transported and treated properly. Okay, and what, what is interesting about that is, um, is by having a toilet or by having a functioning sanitation system, it is not a service just for a person. It is a service for the community because by not having it, you're actually harming all of your, the other folks in, in the community. So this, this, this idea of having a, a human right to protect from someone else, like the idea of doing harm to someone else is really important. And using that kind of pressure, I think, is important. So I mean, those were, I think, just a few ideas uh, that, that, that I thought could be interesting to share. Um, and maybe I will stop there. to Zaha uh, Salutatsu, who is with the UNICE, he's the chief of the Environment for Europe and Sustainable Development section of the uh, Environment uh, Division. Zaha? Thank you very much, Bebe. Good morning. Uh, and first of all, I join uh, with those who already expressed thanks for the for being invited to this uh, uh, meeting. And this is indeed a very good format to exchange views, to uh, understand better how we work, where we are, and where should we proceed next. And this is a very particular day when uh, I can from the perspective of uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, I can link the work which we are doing to the work which we are hearing about now. And uh, I, I feel that there are very many uh, linkages between the two. I represent the uh, organization of UN, the regional organization, and I think it's, a, it's the only regional organization uh, which is represented on the panel. Um, and we actually, the Economic Commission for Europe, started working on the environment quite early, and we already have about 25 years of history of uh, uh, developing uh, environmental instruments under the Commentary on Environmental Policy. While this is a regional, uh, undertaking again. It has a wide uh, global implications already. First, I will start with uh, just uh, reiterating that, as uh, previous panel members already said, environmental rights now are practically recognized as part of the human rights. And then, uh, uh, working for implementation, uh, first of all, let's say codification of environmental rights and then the implementation, it means. Every, uh, in every uh, case, practically we are uh, in touch with broader human rights. So uh, I would uh, straight away go to the um, uh, example which is well known to many of you, it's the uh, Orcus Convention, which is, uh, uh, let me again read uh, after Barbara's example, the full name, <laughs> which is, <laughs> uh, yes. yeah. which is the uh, convention uh, on access to information, uh, participation in environmental decision making, and access to justice on environmental matters. And uh, these are three components of environmental rights, how they can be uh, uh, protected, how they can be, uh, how the obligations about these environmental rights can be created first, and then how they can, uh, these obligations can lead to the protection of wider human rights. This is recognized also by the uh, by John's uh, report, uh, which says that uh, the Orcus Convention is a leading example uh, of implementation of this uh, principle 10, actually, uh, around the globe, principle 10 of the uh, Declaration. So, uh, but uh, later, I thought that it's already quite a while ago, uh, the Orcus Convention um, has got the protocol on uh, pollutants, release, and transfer registers which is a self-funding protocol, and it addresses another side of the problem. 
Um, and here I would uh, actually uh, refer to what uh, Bashkut has mentioned, that the principles are principles, the words in the international agreements can be actually written there, but they need to be interpreted, they need some more work in country to get it done. And the uh, pollution billet and transfer register actually uh, can work in an interesting way. Uh, when companies who are releasing something to the environment, they are more allergic to the, uh, uh, let's say they are in the limelight now. And this helps them to, uh, to understand their own obligations better. So countries which already have this kind of register, they uh, are witnessing some kind of competition between the businesses not to get uh, negative uh, uh, light there. So this is uh, in part also helping the human rights, of course, through release, through uh, uh, the uh, broader recognition, not only by the society, by the government, but, but also by businesses that these environmental rights, when protected, they have positive implications also on the broader human rights, like uh, right on the, uh, for the uh, healthy environment. Um, now let me mention that uh, these are, of course, these are two uh, prominent examples of what regional uh, 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 instruments we have, but these are, first of all, these are not only examples, we also have the uh, ESPO Convention on uh, uh, environmental impact assessment in a transboundary context, which is now uh, practically uh, looked at in uh, several other regions, and one of them is Southeast uh, Asia. In November, on the uh, 9th of November, there will be the um, uh, workshop uh, held uh, uh, in the Palestine nations, uh, which uh, will bring together representatives from that uh, part including uh, actually Republic of Korea, including uh, Vietnam, uh, and uh, I believe uh, uh, some of other countries to look, and, and this is organized, important moment is that this is organized by uh, European Investment Bank. And uh, this is an international financial organization which looks again through this uh, particular uh, uh, instrument, it looks into the possibility to improve its own uh, performance. Let's say this is one again uh, another aspect how this work can uh, broaden the base of institutions and uh, sectors to which uh, environmental rights become more and more important and uh, recognized. Now uh, I have to mention one very alarming aspect of uh, these linkages between environmental and human rights, and this is the protection of environmental activists and whistleblowers. I have a figure. Only last year, in 2015, there were 185 activists murdered around the globe for uh, their attempts to protect environmental rights. And this is very alarming statistics. It is on rise. The figure is big, but it is, it is also on rise. And this may be, on one hand, uh, some sign that more and more people around the globe try to protect their rights. On the other hand, this is an increasing uh, indication that not everybody is ready to accept that. So here we are indeed uh, in the domain of uh, human rights and environment together. Uh, while this problem is uh, recognized in uh, in the declarations uh, and uh, in the documents of the multilateral environmental agreements that we have, this is the global problem, and uh, of course we need here to work together. Uh, and the last aspect, last maybe aspect, uh, uh, on possible ways of cooperation. Um, well, I, actually, I have touched. Uh, there is not much time actually to 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 talk about all of that. Sorry, uh, but I, I have touched a few aspects. First, this is a recognition that there are good practices. And on, on this, our uh, region, sorry for mentioning it again, but we in the uh, pan-European region, we have something to, uh, to share. Uh, second, these good practices should be promoted around the globe. On this, there are already uh, good examples, like, for instance, Orkus Convention, and uh, its uh, um, 
uh, practices have in a way encouraged uh, other regions to walk to the to the direction and uh, there is a very good example of uh, Latin American countries who now are working finalizing in fact uh, their own uh, possibly legal instrument on Prince of Trent. So this is another side, uh, another uh, avenue where uh, human uh, rights and the special representative can promote globally this kind of uh, developments. And uh, well, uh, of course we are ready to work with you to see how we can help from our side and we also need your help. Sorry for being so, well, again, trying to <laughs> put in everything in five minutes, but thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and also for reminding us of the position of environmental human rights uh, defenders, on which uh, John actually also wrote uh, in an uh, earlier report. Uh, and I think it's really important also that we keep reminding ourselves of that. Now I give the floor to Gonzalo. Uh, Gonzalo, maybe you want to sit here? Or? No, I'm okay here. Yeah. Okay, so Gonzalo Oviedo of uh, ICF. Barbara, and congratulations to the two special rapporteurs and the panelists for their um, interventions. Um, IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, for those who are not familiar with it, is a, a membership organization that includes some um, members from governments and civil society organizations. Um, IUCN and, the, and its membership have always been um, following with interest um, the process of um, uh, discussion in the in the UN uh, of the links between uh, about the links between environment and, and human rights, um, and um, our community has welcomed the, the the establishment of the mandates and their evolution, particularly in the last uh, few years, which I think is, is very important. Um, from the from the beginning from the nineties. All IUCN congresses, which happen every four years, have adopted policy decisions and programmatic decisions in relation to the discussion um, on the links between environment and human rights. And um, um, we have engaged in many practical activities in support of implementation, uh, such as uh, environmental impact assessment approaches at a national level, um, engagement with the business community for uh, pushing for reduction of their uh, environmental impacts on nature and people, and, and so on. So we do have a history of the conservation community of, of trying to follow in and trying to contribute uh, to implementation of the recommendations um, emanating from, the, from this process in the UN. Um, and of course, for us, um, engagement in procedural rights has been always uh, absolutely fundamental, particularly since the Rio Convention, since the Rio um, um, meeting. Um, um, it has been a fundamental issue, um, uh, integrating participation uh, in decision making, um, access to information, access to justice, as, as with the rights approach has been uh, doing uh, in our uh, conservation actions in the world. Um, we have, however, been um, uh, observing that there is a, there has been a missing or weak element in the process of discussion, uh, discussing the links between environment and, and human rights, uh, which is essentially the, the lack of complete understanding about what a healthy environment means uh, uh, in terms of human rights. And that is the, the fact that um, nature underpins human rights, ultimately the right to life, and um, uh, biodiversity and ecosystems are at the basis of the right to food, the rights to water, the rights to health, and other human rights. There hasn't been clear recognition of this in the international process of addressing the links. Um, just, to, just to state it in a, in a, in a, in a perhaps simple but um, uh, very important way, all the food that humanity consumes comes from ecosystems, and water comes from ecosystems. There's no artificial generation of water or food that can substitute the functions of biodiversity and the functions of health ecosystems in producing 
food and water and medicines um, for the majority of people in the world. Um, and especially since the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment um, in, the, in, in the early uh, 2000, um, uh, I think there is a clear understanding uh, in the international community that precisely um, ecosystems and ecosystem services they generate are absolutely fundamental for the, for the enjoyment of um, human rights and, and, and for the well-being of people. So this particular element, um, which has not been sufficiently addressed in the past, and which is now in, in, in John's um, um, current investigation, um, is for us of fundamental importance. Our, our position on this is that conservation of ecosystems and the health of ecosystems and conservation of biodiversity is a human right. People have the right to have the ecosystems and biodiversity conserved because their fundamental rights depend on them. And, and, and we um, um, strongly articulate our approach to conservation today on the basis of um, um, this, um, this concept. This is, of course, particularly important, as it has been already clearly stated here, for people who directly depend on nature for their survival, depend uh, directly on biodiversity and ecosystems, and who are, at the same time, in many cases, um, the most vulnerable. Indigenous peoples and rural peoples, um, uh, rural uh, communities and peoples in many parts of the world, who are in a situation of poverty and vulnerability, lack of secure access to um, uh, resources, to natural resources, and uh, weak land tenure systems, and so on. So it's particularly important for them to have this um, um, human rights approach to the conservation of the basis, the, the, the natural basis of their livelihoods and their uh, rights. The other fundamental aspect, of course, of this link between human rights and conservation of nature for us is that conservation has to be supportive of the rights of people, not just in ensuring um, the maintenance of the um, ecosystem services and, and biodiversity uh, for um, human rights, but also in terms of making sure that conservation actions support effectively the achievement of um, what we are interested in um, in terms of um, uh, livelihoods, well-being, and the rights of people more in general. In this sense, in the last um, decade or so, um, the conservation community, um, the, the IUCN conservation community, has been moving uh, towards a, a, a more, a clearer and, and a more, um, a better articulated approach to rights and human rights in conservation. We, in IUCN, we, we, we do have a very clear definition of our actions as uh, rights-based. And, and many of our um, uh, members, particularly the, the largest uh, conservation organizations members of IUCN, they have all adopted a, a, a rights-based approach to their um, conservation actions. We created some years back um, an initiative that we call Conservation Initiative on Human Rights, which is precisely a tool for us to um, develop and promote and uh, um, institutionalize within the conservation community um, and the human rights approach. Outside of our community, there has been some interesting progress in, in terms of moving forward on this, on, on this approach as, 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 as we see. Uh, for example, the development of safeguard systems in, in, in various institutional structures that deal with conservation. This is, this is welcome and it's, it's a positive development that goes in the good direction of making sure that the links between human rights and the environment are, are, are respected and supported and promoted, but it's insufficient. There is still a lot of work to do. And we are um, uh, really looking forward to the recommendations from the, uh, the mandate holders on these matters uh, for us to um, uh, promote those recommendations in terms of strengthening how this is approached in the international system that works for the environment, and particularly in our case for conservation. Uh, that includes, for example, clearer uh, recognition, clearer recognition of the links between human rights and environment in the uh, international conventions, in our case, particularly biodiversity conventions. A stronger um, commitment from the financial system that channels funding for conservation actions in the world about standards and safeguards for, um, 
positively linked to human rights and conservation, which is still um, a weak element in the, in, in the whole system. And of course, um, great uh, engagement from all implementation structures, organizations um, from civil society, obviously governments, um, uh, community and indigenous people's organizations, all the actors involved in environmental action on the ground at the national level, there has to be a clearer convergence and, 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 and more explicit convergence about fundamental principles of human rights in the context of uh, their environmental work, particularly in our case uh, for conservation. So in, in this sense, for us, the work of the, of the mandate holders on environment and human rights is extremely important, is extremely timely, particularly in the way they have evolved in the last few years. And we think that, um, we hope, um, that um, through these, there will be also greater and more productive opportunities for <coughs> engagement between the conservation community and the human rights community for better dialogue, for more constructive dialogue, and, and for more joint action uh, for our common purposes. Thanks so much, uh, Gonzalo. We have now about uh, half uh, an hour for uh, for the review, uh, the opportunity to take a talk, after which uh, Nora Koenig of Switzerland will give us some uh, concluding uh, remarks. Um, if, um, if you would state your uh, name and affiliation, then you take the floor, that would be much appreciated, and we have a, a microphone uh, going around.